So here now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the 15th chapter, verses 20 through 24. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word to our understanding this morning. Let's ask him to bring it alive for us. Our dear Lord, what a beautiful scene this is. I know that my words will not be anywhere close to adequate to bring it alive. So I ask for your spirit to be the one to do that. And I know that he is here in our midst. I pray that he will energize the souls, the minds, the hearts of each person here. I know you speak to all of us in a different way, in a different schedule. It's the same, the same word, though. And I just pray that you will bring it alive to each one of us, that the words that I speak will be the words that you would have me speak. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When I was a child, as most of you know, I was raised by Christian parents, and I was raised in a Christian environment, and I grew up with the scripture being read to me, and family devotions, and uh, a church every Sunday, and being brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and my parents did everything that they could do to make sure that I grew up as a Christian. But as most of you know, just like this son, the younger son, I, I rebelled against my parents and left that um, upbringing behind. And I believe that in each rebellion, there is a line that is crossed, a threshold, a boundary that is destroyed. And mine came when I entered college and I became enamored with the philosophies of Aristotle and Plato, and I began to live a lifestyle that was not like the one I had been brought up in. I developed a drinking problem, wasted 15, 20 years in, in that um, struggle. But um, I left behind the teaching that I uh, had been given. It was like kind of like a, a, a watched tea kettle that for a long time doesn't look like it's ever going to, to get hot. And all of a sudden it explodes in um, the sound and the fury of, uh, of that steam. Well, that was more or less the way that it was with me. And when I began to live the kind of lifestyle that was representative of someone who had left their religion behind... My father reached out to me in one last effort to sort of save me from myself and to try to talk some sense into me, to bring me to myself. But when he could see that I was just plain old hell-bent, that I was arrogant, I was full of myself, I had decided that my upbringing was a farce and that the gospel was just a manufacture, that my parents, even though they had tried, they were quaint, it was, it was a well-meaning but misguided um, sort of upbringing. And when my father realized that there was no talking to me, he said something to me that stuck with me all these years and had a profound effect on me at the time, more so than I realized at that moment, but that I have actually shared with multiple recalcitrant men and women in the years that followed. He said, son, I want you to know that I love you dearly and I would do anything for you, but where you're going, I can't follow. You're about to cross over a line. And when you go across that line, I cannot and I will not pursue you. You will be on your own. And don't think for a moment that you take your religion with you. Don't think for a moment, if this is the kind of lifestyle that you are going to embark upon, don't think for a moment that Jesus is in there with you and you're just sowing your wild oats because this is not the way that God's children act. 
Now, a lot of people would say that's not the way, the way you should act towards a child. I mean, for goodness sakes, you know, keep hitting them. Keep inundating them. Keep throwing the Christian principles and the Christian ease at them until they finally relent and say, enough. My father knew that was a wasted effort. He wasn't interested in a son who acted like a Christian. He wanted a son who was a Christian. So he knew that it was time to let me go. But he said this. He said, if you ever decide to come back, if you ever need to talk about this, if you ever want to return, I'll be right here on this side of that line, ready to embrace you, ready to take you back. No recrimination, no penitence, no groveling. Just come on back and I'll take you back as my son. And it was about 20 years before I decided to finally get there. The Lord worked a, a work in my life and turned me around. And you know something? My father was good to his word. Because he was right there when I returned, ready to embrace me and to take me back. And probably the sweetest gift of my early Christian life was that he gave me a couple of years to honor my father before he died. But what I didn't realize at the time was that he was reflecting the father in this story. That this is what the father here does. And I, I just want you to see that. And I hope to bring it out as we go through the text. That um, remembering this is a trilogy. There are three parables. All of them tied together. In the first parable, a shepherd sought for the lost sheep. He went after him. Left the 99 and went after the one. In the second one, the woman sought diligently for her lost coin. In this one, the father does not seek his son. He doesn't pursue him because he knows that the son needs to experience the consequences of his own sinfulness. And he depended upon the work of the Holy Spirit to bring him back, which he did. So hopefully I'll bring that out as we go through this. As I said, we have three parables, all of them very closely tied together. I don't have time this morning to do them justice because we'd be here all morning otherwise. But let me just explain. There's three parables, all of them, about something that is lost and something that is found. Something that is, is completely lost to its owner, never stops being the possession of its owner, but it seems for all intents and purpose to be lost. And then the joy of restoration, not just finding the lost sheep, but putting it on his shoulders and taking it back to the village and restoring it to its master and to its home. Not just finding the lost coin, but then rejoicing with all of her friends when that occurs. This is a far more intricate parable, far more points. It's brilliant that Jesus puts this together the way that he does. And we've had to divide it into three scenes, the rebellion of the younger son, the redemption of the younger son, and then the reaction of the older son. We're in the middle. I had to divide the middle scene because there's too much richness there. Last week, we talked about the actual repentance of the son this time we're going to look at the glorious redemption that occurs when he's restored to his father several things I want to just bring out about those scenes first of all that the sin that the young man committed against his father we have to step out of our culture and into that one this was an egregious, a despicable sin for him to take his father's property, ask for his inheritance is something that would never be done in that particular culture. But the son did it anyway. And then he cut all ties. I don't care if I'm your son. You're no longer my father. I just want the stuff that you have. I'm going to convert it into money. I'm going to go to a foreign country. So I can sin egregiously. Not the way the Hebrews do. So he goes into the, to the Gentile country. He flitters away his um, inheritance. Squanders it with reckless living. Both of those words speak of the wastefulness of taking property that was in his family perhaps for generations converting it into cash and going out and spending it on people that he 
didn't even know. Well, of course, it ran out and he finds himself in need. And that's when God met him at that place. <laughs> Not as you might expect. He met him with a famine. He met him with something that would place a boundary around him again and bring him to his knees to the very bottom of the barrel. He turned to his good time buddies. They're all gone. There's no one there to help him. And he finds one man that he glues himself to. And in order to get rid of him, that one man sends him out into the fields to feed his pigs. So severe was the famine that... He can't even eat the food that the pigs are eating. And that is where he comes to himself. I spent so much time talking about that last week. That is a discussion of repentance. That is looking at the, the, the fallen self. The self that led him to the pigsty in the first place. The self that was so destructive. Turning from that self and turning to a new self. A new creation that it occurred. That doesn't happen without the work of the Holy Spirit changing the heart. Remember, this is not just a parable about a recalcitrant son and a dysfunctional family. This is a parable that Jesus in the first two parables made sure we knew. This is all about redemption and that heaven erupts with joy when one sinner repents. That's what we're seeing in the story. A man repenting, turning from his fallen self, turning to a self that represented the restoration of the Imago Dei, the image of God. God that he was made in, but not his image, Christ's image. Christ's righteousness is the only way that we will be redeemed, the only way that we will be restored. Well, when the man came to himself, he began to think about, well, you know, my father's hired hands, not even his servants, at least they have food to eat, and here I am starving. He comes to himself, and part of coming to oneself and redeeming, being redeemed and regenerated is that your mind starts working again, and you look around you and say, I can't stand the sinful life that I'm living anymore. I can't live here anymore. And so he says, I'm going to go back to my father. And he begins to, he begins to, recite what he's going to say to his father. Father, I have sinned against you and I sinned against heaven. I'm not worthy of being your son anymore. Just make me one of your hired men. Not your servants, not living in your home, not benefiting from the estate, but just somebody who comes in and works the day for a denarius. Works the day's labor here and there. I don't even want to be your servant because I don't deserve to be that. Just let me, let, let, let me try to, 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 to work as a hired hands. Now, we ended up last week by the beginning of verse 20. So let's kind of begin there again. I know that's a very inadequate uh, recounting of where we are. But uh, some of it will come out uh, as we go through. Because in the beginning, he said, And he arose and he came to his father. To arise means that he instigated an action. He looks around him in the pig pen and he says, I have no business being here. I am going to return to my father. That came after the repentance. That comes after the regeneration, the new self, the new creation. Once again has the ability to reason properly, to look at the signs around them and say, this is not what I was cut out to be. And he decides to go back to his father, but when, when he recites what he's going to say to his father, we, we recognize that there's a flaw in his understanding of his repentance. He had a rabbinic understanding. He had an understanding that is quite prevalent in so many churches and denominations today. He says, I repent. Yes, his repentance was real because he says, I have sinned. But he, he said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to work for my father. And then maybe, maybe after I build up a little bit of money and I can pay him back for some of the egregious sin I sinned against him, maybe then he will accept me back. So it's repentance, but it's repentance that requires me to do something, to pay for it in some way. We're going to find out that that's not at all what the young man is going to find when he gets home. How silly that is, actually, if you really want to get down to it. A denarius a day. A denarius a day is pretty much what a hired hand would make for a full day's labor. How far do you think he's going to get paying his father back with a denarius a day? 
He took a third of his estate. He took land that had been in the family for generations. He sold it and he squandered it. Now he's going in as a part-time working today and not work tomorrow kind of laborer. How do you think he's going to pay his father back? It's flawed from the beginning. And yet, that represents most of humanity, folks. Most of humanity thinks that they are going to work off their debt to a holy God by being good people. By somehow, through their own piety, through their own goodness, through, through the way that they live their lives, that I'm going to be able to pay back the debt that I owe a holy God. Well, that holy God is infinite, and he's perfect, and he's eternal. And you could not pay off one of your debts, ever. So therefore, it takes an eternity of punishment to pay back those debts. But you know, when this young man starts back home, he is not prepared for what is going to happen. In fact, no one is prepared for this. So let's go on and see what happens as that continues. He says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. What an amazing scene that is. Once again, I want to remind you that the father had let the son go. The father had not pursued the son. Even though in the first two parables we saw that seeking, we saw the pursuit. In this particular instance, the father had remained. He didn't pursue his son. In fact, I can see him saying the same thing to that son when he left that my father said to me. Son, I love you. Yes, you've sinned terribly against me, but I love you nonetheless. You will always be my son. I can't follow you where you're going. I will not follow you where you're going. But I'll be right here when you come back. We have a ridiculous notion in the church, brothers and sisters, that what we need to do with recalcitrant sinners what we need to do with the people who grow up in the church, and as Ms. Brandy said earlier, the seeds that we sow and they fall on the path or they fall on the rocks, that what we need to do is to jump in the pit with them. That really what we need to do is to reduce the standards so that they will come into the church so that they won't be offended. And somehow by osmosis, the gospel is going to rub off on them. But that is exactly the opposite of what we should do. If we jump in the pit... We're, not, we're both in the pit. <laughs> Who's going to pull the other out? If the light goes off in the lighthouse so that we can be with the ships on the stormy sea, how are they going to find the harbor? And so the church has a job, and you have a job as a Christian to be the light that shines in the darkness. It doesn't mean become darkness. It doesn't mean reduce the standards. It means stand by them, but oh, be there, right there. At the edge of the property. Now Jesus doesn't say this. He doesn't put it this way. But this of course is the way I see it in my mind. As the father follows that boy out. And it reaches the edge of that property. Wherever it is. Maybe he's out in the field. Maybe it's in the village where they would live. And he comes to the edge of the village. Maybe he, he's on top of, a, of his house. On the roof looking out or on a hill. But the way I see it. Yes he will not follow that son. But every day. He's looking down. Now granted. Granted, he could have seen him from a far way off because he's just working in the field and happens to look up and he sees this guy. I don't think so. I think that loving father has gone out every single day to the edge of the property and looks down that dusty road, hoping upon hope and wishing upon wish that he would see his son returning down that road. But every day he goes home saddened because his son doesn't come. But not this day. On this day, he sees in the distance a lone traveler. 
And there's something about him. He doesn't know exactly what it is. He doesn't seem to walk exactly like his son did. But he gets a little bit closer and his heart sinks because it's not the, the, the self-confident son who left in fine clothes that had the money and so arrogantly was going to take the world by the tail. This is a vab- vagabond. This is an emaciated man. This is a man with a scraggly beard and unkempt hair. And his clothes are nothing but rags and covered with the filth of a pigsty surely that's not my son but when he comes closer the man can see the unmistakable likeness he sees his image in the boy's face and even though that image is terribly marred and terribly corrupted it's still there and he knows that his son has returned No one expected what happened next to happen. The son didn't expect it. The townspeople wouldn't have expected it. And the Pharisees Jesus is talking to would not expect it. The man ran to greet his son. Aristotle said one time that great men never run in public. This simply was not done. This is an entire parable about things that simply were not done. Well, the one thing that a nobleman, a landowner, a great man would never, ever do would be to run. And yet this man runs. Now, you know how he has to, what he has to do to run, don't you? He's got this long flowing robe right down around his ankles. He can't run with that robe. So what he's going to have to do is gird his loins. And that means that he's going to reach down behind him and grab the hem of the back of his robe. And he's going to hike it up between his legs as tight as he can, exposing his knees, and then tuck that in his belt. And off this elderly, he's got to be older, running down the road, his robe flying in the breeze, his, his, his beard probably back, as Dr. Sproul says, his knobby knees pumping like pistons, running down that road. Running for his son. Now a couple of things occur here that perhaps you wouldn't expect. The word that is used for run here is not a word that means to trot. It's not a word that means to saunter. It's not a word that means to just sort of walk fast. It's a word that means to sprint. It's the word that John used when he talked about how John the Apostle overtook Peter when they were running to the tomb to see they had heard Jesus had been risen from the grave. And he ran faster than Peter. He outran him. That's the word that is used. He's sprinting towards his son. I don't care where he was. Probably in the village because that's where he would have lived. He could have been out in the properties. But no matter where he was, the sight of a, of, a, of a nobleman up in years running down the robes with his loins girded is going to attract attention. So there's two things that he accomplished. First of all, the main reason is, and this is what Jesus said, he felt compassion. There is a a love, there is a pathos. It just blows up in him and he cannot stand there. He doesn't care what the world thinks of him. But there's a couple of very utilitarian things that would go along with it. First of all, as you may remember, the boy burned all of his bridges. He made a severe separation from his father. He made a separation from his brother. He made a separation from the village, from his religion, from being a Jew. Everything that he ever was, he simply burned the bridge. So when this arrogant, self-assured, despicable, dishonoring boy returns home in rags... On the, in the down and out sense that he was, covered with the filth of a pigsty with no shoes on his feet, well, the village would gather around him in scorn. They might even begin to be hostile towards him. So the father preempts that. He preempts it by running out to greet his son. And all of this happens before he even gets into the village. All of this happens so that the whole village can see that the father accepts and restores the son right in front of their eyes. Oh, but there's something else. There's something amazing that occurs here. 
The man runs out, and as he does, what he does is shameful. It's not conventional for, a, as I said, for a man to run out like this. It is totally and completely, he's bringing the shame upon himself so that he can cover his son's shame. He runs to his son so that everybody looking at it would say, boy, look at the shameful behavior of that, of that land-owning man. That would never happen. And so the focus is on his shame and not his son's shame. That's what the father does. He covers his son's shame with his own. When he runs and finds the son, he falls upon him and begins to embrace him. The actual words that are there is he falls upon his neck in the Greek. That's what happened to him. And the same exact sort of Hebrew idiom is used back in the story of Joseph. When Joseph is number two in command of, the, of Egypt and his brothers come and he sees Benjamin, his younger brother, for the first time. And, and he plays the ruse for a while, but when he can't hold it in anymore, his emotions overflow, he falls upon his neck. That's what the father does to his son. He falls upon his neck. He grabs him in a massive bear hug and literally tries to squeeze the life out of him. This isn't just a, a, a little handshake. This is a hug to show everyone that this is a restored son. And then he kisses him. Once again, not a peck, but appropriate. It was a kind of kissing that occurred when you either said hello to someone or you said goodbye to someone you dearly, dearly loved. It's the way that the elders of Ephesus said goodbye to Paul in Acts when Paul left. Uh, and and they, they embraced him and they kissed him. This is a profuse kissing that the father does of his son. Covering him with his own love and preempting the scorn of the village, covering him with his shame. You do realize where I'm going with that, don't you? You do realize that's what God does for us. He covers our shame with his shame. And the Garden of Eden is where it all started because when Adam and Eve first sinned against God, remember that? They hid from him in the cool of the evening when God would have relationship with them. And they said, we were ashamed of our nakedness. And God says, who told you that you're naked? So yes, there are consequences for that sin. Yes, they are cast out of the garden. Yes, there's separation between Adam and Eve and God. But what did God do when he sent them away? He covered their shame by making some clothes for them out of animals. Paul says this to the Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The writers of Hebrews says, Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Peter says, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. You realize what the Father is doing. You realize what is happening. When Jesus came, God humiliates himself. That means God shamed himself. We just finished studying this in the second chapter of Philippians. He took on the attributes of a human being and shamed himself so that he could walk on this earth, so that he could be mocked and spit upon and rejected and hung to a cross so that your shame... Could be atoned for. No other way, folks. No other way that your sins will be atoned for except through God's plan of redemption of Jesus Christ. He is the one that preempts the scorn. Do you have any concept of how much your father loves you? You remember, we've been talking a lot about the cosmic initiative 
And that's Jesus coming to earth and and the whole purpose for his coming. And we've talked about a variety of things. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to destroy evil, not to make an alliance with it, but to stomp on the head of the serpent. He came to restore the Imago Dei, the image of God, not with our righteousness, but with his righteousness. But another thing that he came to do was to introduce the triune God, to to drive it home, that God is one in being and three in persons. And he introduced continually people to the fact that the Father loved them. He was a God of love. We read earlier in Luke, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. A little later on, he says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the reason I chose that responsive reading that we had earlier. Do you have any conception of how much your father loves you? How deeply and how completely the Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Can you imagine the creator of the universe singing over you? As this boy runs out and his father embraces him like this, I hope you can hear the heavenly choir in the background. I hope you can hear what Jesus said after the second parable. Just so I tell you, the angels of God rejoice when one sinner repents. That's what we're seeing here, brothers and sisters. This is not a story about a recalcitrant boy who goes back to his father because he can't pay for his keep. This is redemption. This is God's plan of redemption. And it's a beautiful picture that shows it. Well, anyway, the boy goes back, and we're in the 21st verse. He goes back, and, and he's got a whole uh, um, um, message that he's going to give to his father recited. Just try to put yourself in, in, the, in the boy's shoes, okay? You're, you're, you're walking back. You're emaciated. You're hungry. You, you, you don't even know if you're going to make it back, and you're scared to death because you did not leave under good situations. You burned your bridges big time. And so you're, 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 you're rehearsing your speech in your mind. And he goes over and over, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I, I don't deserve to be your son. Uh, uh, just make me one of your hired hands. Over and over and over again. Can you imagine when he gets close to the house and he looks up and here comes his aging father running at full speed, knobby knees and all directly tore him. The poor boy must have said, I'm dead. I'm dead, but he's going to take my head off. He's not exactly not angry at me. Imagine how shocked he was when his father grabbed him in that embrace and fell upon his neck and began to kiss him profusely. Oh my goodness, the boy has come face to face with something that he had no idea of. And that's going to be reflected in what he says. The boy has come face to face with grace. The boy has come face to face with his father's love and his father's compassion and forgiveness that has nothing to do with him, but comes from his father. So he starts to tell his father, he says, "Um, the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You notice something missing? You know something left out from the speech he was rehearsing over and over and over again? It's that last phrase. Just make me one of your hired men. He he, he doesn't say that. It just wouldn't make any sense at that time. Now, crass minds, I think, and skeptical minds look at it and say, well, the boy has assessed the situation pretty accurately. 
He says, oh, I'm not in as big trouble as I thought I was. So therefore, I'm just going to keep quiet and not say anything about being a hired man and seeing what this falls out to be. If that's the way that you see this parable, you lose the beauty of it. You've completely misunderstood the parable. The boy has repented, but he has a rabbinic idea of repentance. He doesn't understand the grace of his father. The father comes running out with love and and forgiveness and and embraces the boy and he forgets all about trying to work off his debt because he's face to face with the love of his father. He realized something for the first time, I think. He realizes that his father's not really interested in the money. He's all ready to do penitence. He's all ready to try to work this thing off. It's going to take him a thousand years because he's not going to be able to do it at, 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 a, at a denarius a day. But his father's not interested in that. He's not interested in reparations. He's not interested in any kind of penitence. He's not interested in any kind of groveling. The father wants one thing. Relationship. The father wants relationship with the boy. Let me repeat that as a principle. I cannot tell you how important this is. The father is not interested in property or money or reparations. The father is interested in relationship with his son. That leads us to a second principle, just as important. What the father wants, the son realizes he can't provide. He can't pay for it. He can't buy it. He can't work it off. He didn't earn it. What the father wants was a relationship. Well, he severed those relationships. He cut them off. If there's ever going to be a relationship between the father and the son, it's got to be the grace of the father. It's got to be the compassion of the father. It has got to be completely the instigation of the father. The son has no ability whatsoever. To restore relationship. Only the father does. Let me give you that as a principle. But the father wants from the son. The son cannot give or earn. It's a gift. Of grace. I hope that you see. God's plan of redemption is here. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Out of works, so that no one can boast. Salvation is not of you. Salvation is not of me. Salvation is not of our good works. Salvation is of the Lord. It has to come from God to us. There's no other way. It's a one-way street. We have cut off every single right that we had as sons and daughters. If there's ever going to be a reconciliation between God and us, it has got to come from God. That's why Isaiah says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. Jonah said, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jesus made it clear that there was only one way to this salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peter, in his great sermon to the Sanhedrin, said, There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. My dear friends, there is, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much more definitive the word of God can get. If you have any belief that this is indeed more than just the writings of a bunch of Hebrew m- m- myths, well, you have to recognize what he says about your salvation. It's not going to happen any other way than his way. It's not going to happen. Well, if the boy thought that the showering of kisses was the extent of the father's love for him, well, the showering is going to continue, but not kisses, but with gifts. Notice what he says in the 22nd verse. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Notice that he lets no time pass. He says to his servants, quickly, right this moment, no time for recriminations, no time for reparations, no time to discuss this. I want 
to restore to my son right this minute as quickly as I possibly can. Now, first of all, he wants his son to know that he has been redeemed. Secondly, he wants the villagers to know. He wants everyone that sees this, and trust me, (laughs) this would have brought a lot of eyes from that village. He wants them to know that he has fully restored his son. Now, he gives him three gifts, all of them with special meaning, symbolic meaning, not only within the parable, but also eschatologically, as far as the whole idea of redemption. The very first thing that he does, he puts on him the best robe. Now, there's only one robe that that really can be referring to. Again, we have to step into their culture to see the best robe in the household would be the father's robe. You see, the father would have a robe that was only worn on feast days, only worn at weddings. It was passed down to him from his father and his father's father and his father's father. And it would be passed down ordinarily to the first son, the elder son. But here he gives that robe, that robe representing complete uh, uh, inclusion back into the family to that son. Well, the Bible talks about robes a lot. And it talks about a robe when it talks about how righteousness is restored. You see, it's almost like putting on a robe because it's not our righteousness. Your righteousness will never be enough to stand before a holy God. Get it straight. I don't care how good you've been or I don't care if you have been atoned for and forgiven. Your righteousness is still the righteousness of a sinner. You need perfect righteousness. You need the righteousness of Christ. That's why the robe is put on. Isaiah puts it this way. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. I have a beautiful picture of this in the book of Zechariah, where we read almost exactly the same situation. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Once again, I tell you, this is, the clo- this is the robe of Christ's righteousness. No one will enter the kingdom of God without it. No one on their own righteousness will ever stand in the presence of God. Jesus told a very powerful parable in Matthew of a great banquet. He told it a little bit differently because he says there was a big party, a wedding feast afterwards, and there was a man in there who had no wedding clothes. When the king came in to look at the guest, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. How did you get in here, the king says. Throw him outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The robe is the robe of Christ's righteousness. We see the martyrs in heaven in Revelation under the altar. And they have robes that are, oddly enough, doesn't seem right. They're perfectly clean. They're beautifully clean, but they're washed Not in water and soap, but in the blood of Christ. Talks about the righteousness that is Christ, that must be done. That's the picture. That's why this is such an important, beautiful picture. You can just imagine the the pitiful picture of this this boy standing before his father, covered in in, in the filth of the pigsty. And the father takes the robe and he covers him with it. Talk about the restoration of the Imago Dei, folks. What a beautiful picture that is. Second thing he does is he puts a ring upon his finger. And again, this is not just any ring. Scholars agree that this would be the signet ring. Every nobleman like this had a signet ring with his seal on it. It's what he used to to sign letters with. You'd seal it in wax and then he would sign it by stamping that ring in it. It was a ring that meant authority. Once again, going back to the story of Joseph. When Joseph was made the number two man in all of Egypt, Pharaoh gave him his signet ring. And basically it says that you are now as much of an authority as I am. If you say it is, then it's like me saying that it is. For the son to come home and his father to give him his signet ring is to reestablish his authority. 
not only to restore him, but to exalt him. But how does that happen? How does a son who has declared openly, I'm not your son, I hope you die because I'm taking my, 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 my inheritance. How does a son who's not a son become a son? Something that the Coxes discovered earlier this week through adoption, through the beauty of adoptions. When the fullness of time had come, we read in Galatians, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Brother Clayton read that earlier. You adopt him. That's what the ring means. It's the ring of authority. And it says, I'm adopted by my father. The kingdom that is my father's is mine because I am his. Third thing that he gives him are shoes. Put shoes upon his feet. Now, we don't know how the boy lost his shoes. Obviously, he's barefoot. He wouldn't eat shoes. Maybe they just deteriorated over time. Maybe they were stolen. Maybe, maybe the pigs ate them because they might have been made of leather. Maybe he sold himself out to this guy he attached himself to. And in those days, slaves, one of the ways that slaves were identified is for the most part, they were kept barefoot. So to give a barefoot slave a shoe or shoes means that you're not a slave anymore. You've been redeemed. You're free. Jesus made it clear what this means in John when he says that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And Romans, Paul says beautifully in one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. My dear friend, I said this earlier, but you may not have been here. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you have not accepted the love that God pours out upon His, just pay attention to the difference between these two. Think about the citizen of the, of the foreign country who wouldn't give the boy anything and send him to the pig farm to get rid of him. And, and, and think about this loving father who runs, embraces him, showers him with kisses, showers him with gifts, puts his own robe on him, gives him the signet ring of authority, and now the sandals of freedom. That's what our Father does to us. That's what God does to those who love Him, who trust Him, who believe in His Son. He gives them everything. The heirs of the kingdom. Well, He's no longer a slave in that. And it's not over. <laughs> he's just beginning. The celebration begins, look in verse 23, and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Jump down to the end of verse 24, and they began to celebrate. Once again, we want to keep this into the context of the trilogy of parables. This has been a consistent idea here, that of the celebration when that which was lost is not only found, but restored, when it is restored to its master, restored to its father, restored to its God, there is celebration in heaven, the likes of which we can only imagine. A celebration, the likes that are, are so amazing because it is all over one sinner who repents. Now, we saw those other two celebrations, and we also saw Jesus himself apply it to the process of redemption, but here we sort of see the same thing on steroids, because he kills a fatted calf. Now, I am told that a fatted calf will feed about 200 people at this. So basically, the man invites the whole village. He invites the entire village and says, celebrate with me. Celebrate with me because my son has returns. My son is back 
Oh, that wedding feast, that feast that we're talking about is not just the feast of this boy. It's the eschatological feast when the bride of Christ is united with her husband. We are the bride of Christ and Jesus is the bridegroom. And it is a blessing beyond belief for those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's exactly the kind of celebration that we're seeing. Well, as I said, um, and as I realized that the, at the end of each one of the previous um, parables, there was a little bit of an application. Jesus doesn't necessarily give one in that sense here, but he does give us an application, and that is here in the 24th verse. For this is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. What an incredible statement that is. To, again, we're not talking about recalcitrant sons. This is my son who is dead in his trespasses and sins, as we all are. Paul goes on to say, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My son who was dead spiritually has been reborn. As Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. You must be regenerated. A new heart needs to go into that fallen heart that leads you astray. A heart that loves God and will always turn you towards God. Will always arise and return to God. That's the heart that has been restored a new birth he goes on to say that he was lost like the coin that fell into the dirt in our natural state separated from our father we are lost in a sewer of filth we are in the pigsty folks I, I mean if you have a hard time with that I, I'm sorry but I mean if you really look at yourself and you ask yourself how good am I really in God's estimation, I think that you can see the obvious. You're, you're judging yourself by other humans. You're not judging yourself by God. He's lost. He's been lost in the sewer of this world. And now he is found. He has been restored to me. I didn't go searching for him. He never ceased to be my son. He thought he wasn't my son. He cut off all ties with me. He thought he was dead to me. But if you are his, you are never dead to him because you bear his image. Oh, he was his son. He was his rebellious son. He was his dishonoring son, his lost son, his wayward son, his horribly fallen son, his corrupted and marred son, his sinful son, his down and out son, his starving son, his dead son, but he never ceased to be his son. He loved him no matter what happened to him and now... He's his regenerated son, his repentant son, his redeemed son, his restored son, his soon to be glorified son who will spend an eternity praising him forever and ever and bringing glory to him. Hallelujah for God's plan of salvation and redemption. Brothers and sisters, you can't make this up and you can't replace it. You can't replace it with yourself. Now, there's so many different applications that I could go. I just want to focus on one very briefly. We talked about a lot of them as we went through this. But as Brandy said earlier, it's hard to be in ministry and to watch people fall by the wayside. It's hard to be a pastor and to see people come to this church in need and come to say they know Jesus and then to fall right back into the world. It is devastating to watch our young people so often grow up in this church, know them since they were infants, and to see them grow up and then they leave and they go out into the world and they fall, as, as, as the, the parable of the sower says, into the clutches of the thorns or into the clutches of the culture. It's hard for us to see that, brothers and sisters, but I think we need to take a model here. We need to look at this because... 
I'm not saying that you don't do everything that you can do. You cannot possibly stop loving your children or loving those who are here or you share the gospel with them until you're absolutely blue in the face. But there is a time that they can cross a line. And I have had to say this to multiple people in this congregation who have decided they're going to fall into the world and they're going to indulge the ravaging of their flesh and the, and, and the sensuality of this world. And I have said, I can't go with you you I will not follow you into that place if you decide to go that route if you decide to live a life that is contrary to the life that Christ has given us then you go alone just make sure you don't think you're taking Jesus with you just make sure you don't think that you take your religion with you because you won't John says if you go out from us it's because you were never one of us and parents, especially for you, the worst thing you can possibly do is to give your wayward children a false sense of salvation. Oh, they love Jesus, even though there's not a speck of their life that shows that. Don't take your religion with you. Don't say you take Jesus with you when you go to the pigsty. Because that is where God is going to find them. Your offense is on your knees before that God praying for His Holy Spirit to have that child, that person, come to their senses to turn from that evil self and turn to the redeemed, regenerated self. There's no one who can do that but the Holy Spirit of God. And your greatest power is on your knees. Don't follow them. Oh, but make sure that you say, I'm right here when you come back. There's no blame. There's no guilt. There's no reparations. You're not going to have to work your way back into my good graces. I wait for you with open arms to embrace you, to shower you with kisses, to celebrate the robe that has been placed upon you, the robe of righteousness that God has given you to celebrate the signet ring that is on your finger of the adoption as his son or as his daughter to celebrate the fact that you no longer are barefoot like a slave, but you have been freed from that which holds you slave. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that when that happens... Heaven erupts over one sinner who repents. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we give you the glory. Help us in our weakness. Oh, it's so often it's, it's well meant. meant. We, we desperately want our loved ones or those who come to us that you send to us and we think that they are here and that they fall into the world again. We desperately want to follow them. We desperately even want some time to say, well, it's okay, just stay in our midst and, and you can go on sinning. That's not your plan. That's not what you brought. I mean, we have to trust you. There is no salvation except from, from you. Salvation is from the Lord. When are we ever going to get that through our heads? So, dear Lord, let us continue to share. Be right there on that, that line, ready to talk, ready to counsel, ready to love, ready to embrace. But to let you do your job. And to not pursue in places that we should not be. Giving you the glory in Christ's name. Amen.